Should turn it on first. What's up, man? How y'all doing? You doing good? All right, well, fantastic. I get the awesome opportunity to introduce uh, a friend and uh, a man of God. Uh, he is a, a, a wonderful vocalist. He's a, a songwriter. He's an author. He's, um, he's a dad, and he's a husband, and he's a man that has an amazing testimony. Uh, his uh, book is out right now called I Am Number Eight. He has those here. You want to get that before you leave here. I just completed it a couple of days ago. Awesome, awesome, awesome testimony and word of God. And just with all of that being said, uh, this, is, this is my friend, uh, and I've heard him speak before. He's got a television show on OWN Network uh, called The Book of John Gray. A very accomplished man, uh, world-renowned speaker, uh, but more than that, he has a heart after Jesus. And that's why he wanted to be here with us on this weekend, uh, because he knows there are men here that have hearts after Jesus. And so if you will, if you would just take a moment, shake yourself loose just a little bit, stand up and give a round of applause as we introduce and bring forth uh, Pastor John Gray. Fellas, how you doing? It is an honor to uh, be here at Victory, and uh, I'm grateful that I'm still saved after coming 85 North. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how many words I wanted to say that did not reflect biblical scripture. You got to be real saved to live in Atlanta and drive in traffic, people cutting you off. You son of God, bless you. Bless your heart. Shout out to that man who was just uh, doing comedy because I hope you have your resume ready. <laughs> he will not be back. No, I'm playing. <laughs> you are fired. Now, he was funny. Give it up for our brother. He did a great job. <laughs> Phenomenal, brother. Um... If you'll do me a favor and just lock elbows with the brother next to you, elbows, not hold hands. We're grown men, we're not holding no hands. I'm like, did you want to interconnect? No. <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> when a predator spots prey, they don't go for the animals that are connected. The predator goes after the isolated animal. Now, by the way, I don't know how the culture is here, but I am a Negro, and so I like it when you talk back to me when I'm preaching, like a, that's right, brother, right on, yeah! I like all of that. I'm gonna say it again. Preach! Yeah, I need all that, right? I'm up here looking like an upside down pyramid with my tiny shirt on, I'm big up here. Little in the legs, just <laughs> look like a fidget spinner. Just, just, in here, just. <laughs> the enemy wants to figure out how to take you out because his job is to steal, kill, and destroy. It's his mission. He hates you. And maybe you didn't know why, but every time he sees you, he's reminded of what he used to have. The level of relationship that he used to enjoy is now enjoyed by the sons of God. Amen. See, Romans 8, 18 and 19 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present age are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits the revealing of the sons of God. And when you are a son of God, when you know who you are in your identity, the enemy hates that because... You have a direct connection to your father. When that veil was torn from top to bottom when Jesus died, it gave us direct access to our heavenly father through the blood of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit empowers us to be the men that will change society. There is nothing more necessary, valuable, or dangerous than a man of God who knows who he is. Arr I know you got your elbows right there. Now, let's just rock back and forth for a second. Yeah. 
It would have been better if we were standing up, because this feels like a we are the world moment. <laughs> like, this is awesome. I love you. <laughs> You're amazing. It's time for us to stop being domesticated. I need us to get that swag back, that, that thing back. Like, what? You trying to take my family, what? You trying to ruin my children's lives, what? You trying to mess up my marriage, what? You can't have these schools, what? what you, you trying to mess up my, my job, what? No, we need some men that know who they are and just rock back and forth and let that devil know as long as I'm alive, you're going to have a problem on your hands. Or there's some men that'll stand up right now, unlock elbows and make some noise for Jesus. I need some men. Let's go. In the chapel, let's go. Every man of God in here, let's go. I will not go quietly into the night. I will not be silent. I will not be muted. And I will not apologize for my love for Jesus Christ. Are there any men of God in this place? Isn't it strange that everywhere else we go, we're allowed to be passionate and loud? And then in church, they want us to sit still and be quiet. Y'all got a new stadium out here for the Braves, and y'all about to have a Mercedes-Benz dome for them dirty birds that should have won that game. I'm still mad. I don't like Tom Brady. My firstborn son was born in Atlanta. I found my wife in Atlanta. I lived in Atlanta. I ain't want to see them win. Pray for me. My point is this. <laughs> When the Falcons score a touchdown, you could be sitting next to a perfect stranger. You'll jump up and down, high five that person, hug them. They might not even like you outside of that stadium, but y'all have something common in this product on the field. And y'all jumping up and down and got all this passion for a team that doesn't know you. Then you come to church and you quiet for the God that saved you. I need some men in here to make more noise for Jesus Christ than you ever did for the Falcons, the Braves, the Thrashers, the Hawks. God, we love you tonight. We lift you up tonight. We give you glory tonight. We give you praise tonight. There is no God like our God. There is no king like our king. His name is Jesus Christ. Glory! When men of God take their rightful place, everything changes. The household changes. The women love us differently because they've been waiting on us to take our rightful place in God. I'm telling you, when you get home from this conference, it's gonna be on and popping. I can't wait to see my wife. I got a hot three minutes for a hot three. Don't judge me. You do what you do. I got three. You might have ten, but <laughs> each one of us has a measure of grace. <laughs> you get home to your wife, just grab her by the shoulder. Girl, I love God. She'd be like, ooh, praise the Lord. You need to go to that church more often. I want to go tomorrow. <laughs> Let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you will allow this electric atmosphere to become explosive. Holy Spirit, do whatever you want over the time that we have allotted and be glorified in it. I thank you for every man from every family, from every walk of life. Thank you for Pastor Dennis and his wife, the leadership of this church that literally is pouring into what I think is the most underrepresented and malnourished aspect of the body of Christ. That's authentic Christian manhood. Thank you for this moment. Momentum in Jesus' name. Amen. You give the Lord seven more seconds of praise. Seven, six, five, four, 
three, two. Glory! High five two of the fellas as you take your seat. Montel, I'm gonna have you bless one of the fellas with this. This is my first book. It's called I Am Number Eight. Everybody say, I am number eight. I am eight. This is about the life of David. He was the eighth son of Jesse. Nobody knew who he was. First Samuel 16, a prophet comes to his dad's house to look for a king. Jesse brings out seven sons. He was, he, he didn't even know who he had in his house. And the oil was trying to flow, and Samuel was like, Are all the young men here? Jesse was like, Well, there's the youngest, but you don't want him. Samuel said, go get him. We will not sit down until he comes. I want to encourage every man in here that there is something that the earth needs you for, and people will not move until you get there. <laughs> David was the eighth son. He was overlooked. He was undervalued. He was forgotten by men, but he was not forgotten by God. And his process in anonymous places prepared him for leadership for years to come. And this book is a parallel of his life and my life. And I just want to bless one of the fellas with this. Which one of y'all want this? It's available in the lobby. What you want to do, you'll find it. <laughs> and I got two teaching series. Any warriors in here? If you're not a warrior, this ain't for you. That's you? Okay, hold on, but you, hold on, man. You, that's the, okay, you got that one. That's the one with the flip-flops because you got on red shoes. This is called winning the battle. Uh, this for you? Are you going to listen to it? You 15. You're 18? Yeah, but you got moose in your hair. You going to listen to this? All right. It would be a blessing if you all would consider stopping by. I'm going to be out there. I would love to meet you. If you'll do me a favor, I want you to go to this scripture, Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. I'm reading from the New King James Version, Luke chapter 5. What I am blessed by is to be in a room full of men who either love God or are searching for God. If you are here, perhaps you were invited. But if you're here, you're not here by accident. I believe that we are in the most secular time in history. There is nothing more attacked than authentic Christian manhood. I'm tired of apologizing for loving Jesus. When did Jesus become controversial? When did wanting to do right by your wife and your kids become controversial? All of a sudden, what I believe is controversial, but you can say every filthy thing that come out of your mouth, you can do what you want, smoke what you want, drink what you want, sleep with who you want. But the moment I say Jesus, now you want to you be offended? If you're going to be loud about your devil, I'm going to be louder about my Jesus. I'm looking for some grown men in here. I'm not... Maybe you didn't know, but they're trying to domesticate us. They're trying to neuter us. They're trying to cut our voice off. They're trying to cause us to be afraid. We got too many people pleasing Christians. Scared to let the world know they love Jesus because they don't want to ruffle feathers. Maybe you didn't read the word. You will be hated by all men for my sake. That's why we need real men to step up and say, yeah, for God I live and for God I'll die. I'm not backing down from this word. When you talk about momentum, that means you got to have some, you got you to gotta start slow, but then you start moving. And what we need is for men to wake up from the slumber of apathy and get out of their spiritual lazy boys and realize that our families are on the line and our sons and daughters are on the line and our communities are on the line. And we just can't sit back and say, it's not my responsibility. We need men that say, God, maybe you can use me. Maybe something you placed in me can be used for your glory. I got two amens, one hallelujah, and the guy saying, that thing, he might be, he might be talking to me. Yes, I'm talking to you. If you're alive, God has a purpose for your life. This church is a miracle. I'm sitting in here and I walk in and I see black men worshiping next to white men, worshiping next to Hispanic men, 
I'm sure there's some Native American and some Colombian and some Mexican and Puerto Rican. And I'm, I'm sitting in here and I realize that this is offensive because this is Georgia. And still in Georgia, race is an issue just like it is everywhere else. So the fact that we have all of these men from different backgrounds worshiping Jesus, that is a miracle. We need to thank God. And the church needs to get in front of all of this racial foolishness and let the world know that the only color that matters is red, and that's the blood of Jesus. Are there any men in here that are grateful that God has brought us all together? I don't care what your nationality is. The only color that matters is red, and that's the blood of Jesus. And if you got a problem with diversity, heaven is going to be a real problem for you. Because we all going to be up there. Because there won't be no black section of heaven, no white section of heaven, no Mexican section of heaven. It's going to be one heaven, one king. His name is Jesus. He's who we will be worshiping. We will be in the presence of the Lord. Can I get an A? Man. When it comes to events like this, Momentum, I love that idea. But this whole weekend needs to be about reflection and then reignition for you and I. Because what I'm realizing is that the enemy does not take time off. I'm really trying to offend the devil every day I wake up. Like I want my picture on hell's most wanted list. Any other fellas understand what I'm saying? Unless Jesus comes back, I know this body will pass away. But while I'm alive, I don't want the enemy to gain ground. Not in my city, not in my house, not with my children. But there are moments when I can't do it alone. And the hardest thing for men to be is vulnerable. Because many times in popular psychology, we align vulnerability with femininity, which is a lie of the enemy. Many of us don't have safe outlets to share our heart and our emotions and the things that we go through. Where do men go to bleed? Where do leaders go to bleed? We can't bleed in front of the sheep because a shepherd can't bleed in front of sheep because sheep don't do well with blood. Who can we talk to? Sometimes even our wives don't understand the pain we're in. They don't know what we go through as men on a day in and day out basis. I love God, but sometimes this word gets on my nerves, especially scripture like dwell with your wife in understanding. <laughs> love your wife like Christ loved the church. It don't tell her to love me. It tells her to honor me, it tells her to submit, but it doesn't tell her to love. Why? Because it's a natural inclination of a woman to love, but it's not natural for her to submit. Why does the Bible tell us to dwell with our wives in understanding? Because she's XX, we're XY, which means we have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. She just has two X chromosomes, which means she couldn't understand us really in her heart if she tried. She can try, but we have been given the X and the Y, which means we must task ourselves with building bridges with the wife of our youth, with the woman that God gave us for those who are married and for those who are single. Make sure that you choose someone, not just because of her look, but because she has an anointing to pray for your destiny. I don't care how fine she is. You don't need somebody that's fine when the enemy's attacking. You better get you a woman that can pray and a woman that can intercede because that's what you're going to need if you're going to be a man of God in this day and age. What we need are some... Am I talking right, fellas? We don't take enough time to build men. We always are beating each other up and society pits us one against the other. I just want to take a few minutes to speak life to the men of God that have gathered here and those who may be watching and those who are in the chapel. Because as a man, we are God's ultimate expression of dominion. I need you to understand the picture of who you are. You, you, got, you have so much authority. You have so much swag. You have so much power in this earth. You don't even know. You're just sitting there, and you don't realize you got angels outside waiting for you to get back to your car so they can do their job. 
Because Psalm 91 says he gives his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. You didn't just get home safely. Angels were pushing devils out the way to get you where you're going. Do you realize who you are? Do you realize what you carry? Do you realize your value? And the reason why I'm taking a moment to remind you of your value is because we exist in a, in a culture and a climate that is trying to destabilize what manhood is. Everywhere you go, men are optional. Men are optional. People can have babies now, don't even need the man, just need the seed. Well, you got the seed from a man. My point is this, you're not optional because God doesn't do optional. If you're here, it's because you have a purpose. You can't sneak into the earth. You have to be spoken into the earth. And as a man of God, I came here to celebrate you. We got enough people trying to beat us up and tell us what we're not doing right. And men's health, you need to lose weight. Don't tell me what I need to worry about your own house. I like pancakes. <laughs> I'm slightly offended when I came to the church tonight. I went in back, they had grapes and hummus. I said, did you see my picture? Did you? Go to the food truck and get me a burger and one of them chicken biscuits. I don't fast, I slow. I'm working on it. I know some of y'all, when I got up, y'all thought I was T.D. Jakes. <laughs> get ready, get ready, get ready. <laughs> oh, yeah. So in Genesis 1 and 1, before I go to Luke 5, I got to give you this because I want to encourage you. In Genesis 1 and 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. So the first time we are introduced to the voice of God, he speaks a solution to a problem. What he didn't say is it'd be great if I could get some blown glass and a filament with a metal conductor that I could plug into a wall and turn on a switch. That would be a lamp. He didn't ask for a lamp. He asked for a light. Because a light doesn't need a source because God is your source. Then God goes for five days, starts showing off and starts making things with his mouth. He was like, let's go ahead and get some Water, let's get some sky, throw some stars up here. Let me get a sun going and a moon. Let me get some birds and some giraffes, some monkeys, some rhinoceroses. Get some pterodactyls going. Starts making things for five days. He creates an entire world. And then on the sixth day, he says, before I make this next thing, I need to have a conversation with myself. And he says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and so this is the first time we are introduced to the person of God in multiple facets the father the son and the holy spirit and then it just gives a quick glimpse of John 1 and 1 through him all things were made that were made and not one thing that was made was made without him referencing Jesus and so in the very beginning Jesus was there the holy spirit was there the father was there and he says I've got a world now I need somebody to run it I know I'll make a version of me. I won't speak him. I'll make him. And so God picks up dirt, molds it, and then breathes ruach. He breathes into the dirt. Now, of all the substances that God could have chosen, he chose dirt. Why? To encourage me and you that God still creates in the dirt so you don't have to come to him perfect you don't have to come to him sanitized you don't have to come to him with everything right he still creates in the dirt I got one two three witnesses four five matter of fact we're gonna give God a 10 second praise break for any men that have ever been in the dirt but God still used you 
any men that have ever failed, but God still used you. Any men that want to do right, but you couldn't do right in your flesh because you didn't have the right tools, but God still chose you. Are there any men that are grateful that God still creates from the dirt? Hallelujah. I don't have to come to him perfect. God factored in my humanity when he chose me. He knew what I would do. He knew what I would be, and he still chose me. Tell one of the fellas, he still chose me. God said, let him have dominion. Somebody say dominion. dominion. Over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the beasts of the field, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the face of the earth. And of course, we know what happened. We were given dominion, and then it was taken from us because a transaction took place outside of God's will. Adam and Eve were in the garden. The serpent shows up, starts talking to Eve. You know women love to talk. <laughs> serpent showed up. Did God say not to eat from that tree? Mm-hmm. He said don't touch that tree. That tree is a mess. If you eat from that tree, you will surely die. What's your name? I ain't never met you. Where are you? <laughs> Who are you? And Adam just standing there. If you read, the Bible says he was standing there, and he ain't say nothing. So caught up, because he ain't never seen no naked woman. She ain't had no clothes on. So he just like, hmm, hmm. We lost dominion in the garden. And ever since that moment of dominion was cut off, our fellowship with God was interrupted. But our Heavenly Father had an eternal plan in place to get us back to the original place. And my prayer for us tonight is that we will get back to the original place of intimacy, that we will remove the distractions from our lives that hinder us from having the time of intimacy and fellowship with our Father that he so richly deserves. I can promise you that most of the things that take away our time are not building us in our faith. And as men, as husbands, as fathers, as leaders, as providers, we need more of the word of God now than ever before. But what do you do when you want to get to God you have momentum. We got the momentum. Men's coming. That means we're moving. What if you want to move, but you can't? What do you do when you want to go in the direction of God, but you're stuck? Luke chapter 5, verse 17 says, Now what happened on a certain day as he was teaching, this he is Jesus, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then, behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. When they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and led him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, Jesus said to him, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? But that you know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. What we need is a move of God. Uh, where's the men's pastor? You said something up here. You said, we don't need another church. We don't need another song. We need a move of God. Is that what you said? Yeah, a move of God requires some men 
because God is going to move when the men get in position. If we're going to ever have a move of God, we're going to need some unapologetic Christian men because right now manhood is under attack. And I'm not just talking about male. I'm talking about manhood because maleness is biological, but manhood is responsible. Responsibility and saying, God, what is it you want me to do? This man was paralyzed and he needed a miracle, but he couldn't get it on his own. That's the power of this gathering. The title of my message for the next few moments that we are together is somebody get me to Jesus. Somebody get me to Jesus. I want to thank God for this church that this is a real men's conference. Y'all got food trucks outside. Why? Because men like to eat. Y'all have baseball out there. Why? Because we like to play baseball. We like to shoot hoops. Did y'all have some video games out there too? Y'all have video games? For real? A simulator? Well, see, that's when you're in the suburbs. I don't know nothing about no simulator. I just, <laughs> just, give me, just give me some Nintendo, some Donkey Kong, some Pac-Man. Oh, if the church would wake up and stop trying to make us something other than what we are and speak to us where we are. You want more men in church? We need more stuff like this. I love my wife, but she always want to talk during the game. And I'd be like, babe, this is a holy moment. She'd be like, but I need to share my emotions. I need to talk to you. I need to share. I'm married to a black woman. I need to share with you. I need you to understand. I'm like, babe, this is holy. I got my chicken wings. I got my Mountain Dew. I'm watching the game. This is Bible because the Bible says he will mount up on wings as an eagle. This is Bible. Somebody give him glory. <laughs> Man can't make it like that. <laughs> Yo, kill a kid. Stop trying to domesticate us. Let us be who we are. The problem I've seen with some churches is once we get saved, they want to neuter us, mute us. But the Bible makes it clear that salvation does not materially change your manhood. It unlocks it. See, Jesus saves your soul, but the Holy Spirit sanctifies your personality, which means the gifts that have been hidden or maybe rooted in the flesh, now I can use it for God's glory, but I'm not changing who I am as a man. I still like football. I still like to eat wings. I still like to hang out with the fellas. Maybe we should worship right now. We can worship before 1 o'clock and after 4 o'clock because that's when the game is on. <laughs> I'm for real. Um, Somebody say, somebody get, me to Jesus. somebody get me to Jesus. I love moments like this because I don't have to be nothing. I could just be me. You know, I, this is Father's Day weekend, and I have mixed emotions about it because my mom and dad divorced when I was very young. I saw my father four times in my life. My mother had to be mom and dad, and I'm sure there are fellas in this room that can identify with that, or maybe you had a great relationship with your father. God bless that. Father's Day was never something for me to celebrate. It was a reminder of what I didn't have. When I looked up in the stands, when I was playing soccer, <laughs> yes, I played soccer <laughs> about three weeks. Um, I knew he wasn't there. When I graduated from high school, I knew he wasn't going to be there. He promised he'd get me a car when I turned 16. Never saw it, never heard from him. And I don't know what demons he was battling. I'm not here to judge him because I know how the devil fights men. And he hits us with shame. And he locks us up and he holds us hostage to the worst version of ourselves. And before you know it, even though you want to do right now, all of a sudden you're stuck. Paralyzed. Like the man in this scripture. But thank God he was with the right people. I'm getting ready to preach. Do you know that if you get with the right people, when you're stuck, God can do a miracle in your life? You need to check your circle because I want some friends like this homeboy had. He was paralyzed, 
And I don't know what he did, but the Bible says when he got to Jesus, Jesus says, man, your sins are forgiven. So whatever he was doing when he was with his boys is what got him caught up. That's how he got paralyzed. I don't know what party you went to where you get paralyzed. He was in there like, ah, ah, hey, hey, ah, ah, uh uh-oh. Uh-oh, I can't feel my legs. <laughs> Rest of the fellas, they were just over there like, wobble, 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 baby. What's wrong with, what's wrong with Leon? Get in there. He can't, get in there. I knew y'all wasn't saved over here. It's funny because it is Friday night. Sorry, I had to. I had to. Party's here on the north side, so I pick up a Coca-Cola and I turn it up. Stop it, John. (laughs) He was stuck. Let me ask you a question, fellas. Talk to me in the chapel. Don't lie to your boy. Talk to me. Have you ever been stuck? Some of y'all real safe, like, no, I can't, don't remember. (laughs) Thinking about it, I don't. Stuck. Stuck in a moment. Stuck in a sin. Something that you want to get free from, but you can't. Stuff you can't really tell nobody because you've been coming to church, you've been lifting your hands, but you're still struggling with some stuff. And the devil hits you with shame, and now all of a sudden you're stuck thinking that you're always going to be this person, never get free from this sin, this issue, stuck. The man was stuck because that's what sin does. It gets you stuck. I know she's fine, but you need to understand she's designed to make you stuck. Leave it alone. The grass might look greener on the other side of the fence, but the dog is also meaner. Stay home. She's designed to get you stuck. Perfume all the time. Breath smell like carnation milk, not a corn on her toes. Painted all the time. Smelling like fresh lotion oils and berries and juices. Got the plat at cow, plat at cow. Walk past your death. Do you need anything? No, I'm good. Thank you. Go to the bathroom. Excuse me. Can I get it? Can, can, will somebody give me some dap, please? If you know what I'm talking about. Boy, you 18. You don't know what I'm talking about. Sit down, boy. You ain't even got no job. It's like, I know. I know. I know. I'm talking about some grown men. Let me tell you something. Because they spotting you. They see that ring. They know you're about commitment. They're like, oh, I'm a get him. Isn't that funny? When you were single, she wouldn't look your way. Now she own you. Here's what's deep. Proverbs says that spirit, all who go down to her are strong men. She's looking for the strong ones. I'm trying to help somebody. You can't say amen because they taping. <laughs> You're like, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Lord. But she's designed to get you stuck. He was stuck, but he had the right friends. Montel, I'm grateful because when I get stuck, and I've been stuck, I knew who to call. I got some men in my corner that I could tell them the worst things I'm going through. And like Noah's righteous sons, they'll walk in backwards. 
They'll cover over my broken areas. They're going to be like, ain't you a man of God? Ain't you a preacher? Yeah, but I'm also a hurt man who didn't have a father to tell me who I was supposed to be. And I was abused when I was four and nobody was there to cover me. And so there are times when I'm still fearful and afraid. And sometimes while my wife is asleep, I'm on the side of the bed crying because I don't know how to be a husband or a father. And now I got two kids looking up to me and I'm still looking for my father. And my father died on December 7th of 2000. And how can you be what you've never seen? I'm stuck, but I love God. Is there anybody that can say, I'm stuck, but I love God? I don't get it right all the time, but I love God. And sometimes I need my homeboys around me. I need some men around me that will cover me, that will fight for me. I need somebody that won't let me fall. Have you ever been stuck? The Bible says he was stuck, but they, somebody say they. they. But they brought a man to Jesus. When I'm stuck, somebody get me to Jesus. DeMarcus, stand up. DeMarcus is one of my they. When I'm at my worst, I know I can call him and he's going to do two things. He's going to give me the word and he's going to tell me to go home. There are times when I'm driving saying, I can't do this. I don't know how to be no husband or father. Get, get back in there and you fight. Because see, what I saw is men walk away. I never saw a man stay. You need a they that I tell you, you can be the interruption in the generation. You can be the one that changes this thing. I want to encourage every man in here, doesn't matter where you came from, through the blood of Jesus, you can begin a brand new legacy. I want to encourage every man in here, if you can just get to Jesus, he can change everything. He can break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Some of y'all feel like coming towards the altar. Don't stop, don't stop, just come on. If you feel something breaking, just come on. Because every now and then you need to move. You've been stuck. It's time to get unstuck. The altar represents Jesus. Somebody get me to Jesus. If you need help, tell one of the fellas, man, I've been struggling. Could you help me get to Jesus? For the few minutes that I have left, I'm going to keep preaching. But if you feel led, you do what you want to do. This is your father's house. Montel, he was stuck. He couldn't move, but he had the right they. Somebody asked, will you be my they? Ask him, will you be my they? Let's call him Leon. Leon was stuck. But Ronnie, Bobby, Ricky, and Mike, that was his they. So they were talking like, look, man, our homeboy is stuck. What we going to do? I don't know, man, but we're not going to leave him like this because that's my friend. See, when you got, when you real brothers, you're not going to leave your brother stuck. You're not going to leave him broken just because you got yours. You're going to fight for your brother because he's your brother in Christ. Doesn't matter how he got stuck, he's still your brother. Can I get an amen in here? It's only the church that buries their wounded. I 
don't come here because I'm perfect. I've come here because I'm broken. I don't need you to tell me how tore up I am. I already know that. Tell me that there's hope in the blood of Jesus. Tell me that he can free me and deliver me. Tell me that he can save me. Somebody get me to Jesus. I don't need a psychologist. I don't need a psychiatrist. I don't need a 12-step program. I need a miracle. I'm sure your boy was stuck, and the Bible says he got stuck because of sin. Sin causes you not even to reach out. You're so ashamed of what you did, you stop praying. Am I talking to anybody? He was probably sitting in self-doubt, shame. Man, it's cool, man. This is just what it's going to be. No, nah, man, we ain't leaving you like this. Hey, Ronnie, you remember that dude... Uh, we grew up with, uh, what's his name? What's his name? Jesus. What's his name? Jesus. Oh, yeah, Jesus. Yo, man, I heard he doing some crazy stuff. Maybe if we get our homeboy to him, maybe he could do something. You mean you talking about Jesus we grew up with? Mary, son? Yeah, man. What? Listen, I'm telling the dude is crazy. You remember uh, Ron Tez with the gimpy hand? He stretched that boy out. Hey, you know Stevie, my shady, I'm on. He opened his eyes. Oh, yeah, I do remember Jesus. That's that weird boy when we went swimming. He was walking on top of the pool. Hey, if each one of us grab a corner, we can get him. I heard Jesus is down the street. Why don't we take him to Jesus? I'm sure that... The paralyzed man was feeling, man, it's cool. I don't want to be embarrassed. Man, shut up. You can't do nothing no way. Just sit there. You just down there. Eh. Eh. All right, pick him up. Careful, because even though he's paralyzed, we don't want to injure him further. Be careful with your brothers who are going through it. Don't beat them up because they're paralyzed. Be gentle with them. Step lightly so they know that they're loved, so they know that there's mercy, so they know that there's grace. If you've ever had grace wash over you, if you've ever been a recipient of grace, then maybe you need to praise God right about now. Hallelujah. Yes! They get close. But there's a crowd. They starting to play the music. That means it's time for me to go almost. <laughs> Don't ever give a black preacher 30 minutes. That's like giving a whale a tic-tac. <laughs> I can go. Can I do what I, can I preach how I fit? Okay. Can I do what, can I preach that? <laughs> they near where Jesus is, but there's a crowd. Everybody has a need. Excuse me, ma'am. I'm trying to get a homeboy to Jesus. He's stuck. She turned around. about. Mm. Oh, no, you need to stay in line. You stay in line. You, you need a miracle. You, we need to find another way. She needs to stay in line. The Bible says they couldn't get near the window or the door. So they got a little hood. They decided to get out of the box and was like, yo, he's been stuck too long. We've come too far. Jesus is too close. I'm not going to let a crowd stop me. I know we got a lot of men here, but don't let the crowd stop you from getting to Jesus. I feel God in here. They said, well, what we going to do? We can't get through the door. One of the crazy ones. You always need one crazy one in the group. You need one crazy one in the group. You need one that'll just turn up. You need one with a gun permit. You need one with a sword. Everybody need one ghetto friend. You need one like, guys, let's just talk it out. Then you need the other one like, Poof. he'll be all right. God will save him. Everybody say one. I'm going to tell you, you need one crazy one in the crew. You need one, you know, prayer warrior in the crew. Then you need a negotiator in the crew. Then you got the fourth one. He ain't got no teeth. He's just like, whatever y'all want to do, man. I'm cool. I'm just, I'm just here, man. 
I don't even care. <laughs> the crazy one was like, man, it's hot out here. He on his bed, it stank. He paralyzed. He can't get through the door or the window. Oh, what a word. What about that roof? What that roof looking like? Man, we can't tear this. Man, we gonna, we gonna tear the roof off. Come on, let's go. Excuse us. You stay in line, ma'am. Stay right there. <laughs> Jesus is inside teaching. What's funny is we don't hear about no other healings. They too busy just sitting there, but ain't nobody desperate. <laughs> Only the desperate get the breakthrough. Are there any desperate worshipers? Are there any desperate men of God? Are there any men that say, come hell or high water, I'm going after Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is inside the house. He's teaching and says there's a parable of the lost coin. All of a sudden while he's talking, he feels some rocks go bloop. What mean is this? Forthwith. How does I throw rockets in my bed? <laughs> then he keeps teaching. All of a sudden, some more rocks. <laughs> well, this is highly, highly irregular. <laughs> As I was saying, there was a sheep and I'm a shepherd. Next thing you know, light breaks through. And the crazy one, hey! <laughs> hey, Jesus! <laughs> what up? Hey, man, it's good to see you, man. You doing your thing. Boy, I heard about what you did with Lazarus. That was crazy, man. <laughs> hey, don't mind us. We're just here to put our boy at your feet. The Bible says they laid their friend down. And when Jesus saw their faith, Everybody needs a they because sometimes I don't have faith for the miracle. But if I got the right they, I can still get my miracle. I need they, but you got to watch out for them. Them are the haters. Them the ones that be texting about you like little girls. I don't like him, man. I don't even understand him. What you texting for? Got a separate feed, but you in my face smiling. Be a man. If you don't like me, just say it. We ain't got to hang out and go to lunch if you don't like me. Everybody not going to be your friend. That's all right. But if you got they, they will get you to Jesus when you're stuck. But watch out for them, the Pharisees, the whispers, the haters, the backbiters, the doubters. Jesus saw their faith. And he said to the man, your sins are forgiven. Jesus did the miracle right there. Most men miss it. They want the momentum. But you need the forgiveness before the momentum can begin. Jesus removes the sin first. Oh, help me. So that you can have momentum and not have to stop again. And then he says this, rise. Take up your bed. Walk. Now, I don't know how long he had been paralyzed, but maybe his legs were weak. Maybe he was almost about to fall, but that's why you got they. Need a couple of they up here real quick. Hurry. You got five seconds. I need four of them. That's right. I need they. That's it right there. See, because when my legs are wobbly, I need somebody to catch me if I'm about to fall. Because it's men... It ain't just about you getting yours. It's about making sure that we stay with our brothers until they can get their legs up under them. Until they can walk on their own. I need my they. Don't beat me up because I don't have strength in my legs. Stay with me until I can stand up. Stay with me till I'm a better husband. Stay with me till I'm a better father. Stay with me till I get free from the addiction. Stay with me until I get free from the broken heart 
of a father that wasn't there. Stay with me till I heal from the abuse that happened when I was little. Stay with me. And if I'm about to fall, pick me up. But eventually, I'm going to have enough strength to stand. And I'll be able to take up my bed. DeMarcus, why in the world would Jesus tell the man to take that dirty, Middle Eastern heat stench bed? Because he wanted everyone to see how far Jesus had brought him. Stop walking around here like God has never done anything for you. You need to tell the world what Jesus did. Tell him what you got free from. Tell, God, tell somebody what God delivered you from. Stop acting like you always knew these gospel songs. Stop acting like you've been saved your whole life. Tell these young men out here that you struggled so they have hope. My time is up. But somebody get me to Jesus. Because there's power. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Oh, there is power oh, in the name of Jesus. To do what? To break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Let me pray for you as leadership comes. And if you feel led, get to this altar. As you are coming to the altar, that which had held you hostage, and that which had held you paralyzed has to let you go. Because when you declare that the name of Jesus is above every name, that includes all of our addictions and all of our issues. Father, bless every man under the sound of my voice. I'm not better than them, I'm one of them. And God, I thank you for this opportunity to stand with my brothers in Christ from all different backgrounds at a wonderful church. God, your spirit is here. And I pray that you will strengthen us and that you will give us the freedom to worship you in all of our imperfections. Shame would hold us hostage. The devil says shame on you, but grace says shame off you. And so I declare shame off of every man of God under the sound of my voice. Live, man of God. Be fruitful. Be filled with power. Be the man God created you to be, the husband, the father, the leader, the grandfather, the uncle. Be the entrepreneur, the educator, the banker that God created you to be, whatever area of endeavor or enterprise. And if you've been stuck, may tonight be the night that you get free. Whether through a war cry or through silent tears. May God heal your heart because I know what it's like to be stuck. But thank God I had the right day to get me free. Somebody get me to Jesus. It's power in the name. We can get the band back up here. Hey, I don't care where you're sitting in the aisles. If you got business with God tonight, don't get stuck in your chair. Don't get stuck. And if you're in the chapel, if you're watching at home, get on your knees or get up here to the altar. But this is a moment you don't want to miss. Don't be driving home thinking, why didn't I move? Why didn't I move when I was called? There's men up here. These men are here. They love you. They want to pray with you. You need to tell somebody what's going on. You need to confess it with your mouth. You need to say, hey, this is what's going on. This is what I need freedom from. This is what I need God to move, move me out of and move me into. And if you're doing this alone, 
it's time to stop doing it alone. You've seen where that's gotten you this far. Some of you need prayer tonight. Some of you need to worship and praise your way out of this mess. Some of you don't know where the answer is tomorrow. You don't know uh, where the next check's going to come from. You don't know how you, God's going to save your marriage. And you know what? It's not in you to fix it. You did it on your own street, and that's what got you this far. It's not in you to fix it, but it is in you to get out of your chair and do something. And that's turn it over to Jesus and get some brothers in your life to pray with you about this. So come forward right now. If there's something that's holding you back, this is your chance to come forward and get someone to pray with you tonight. We're going to leave the altar here. We're going to praise and worship for a few minutes. And we're going to let you come forward before we move on to the next. Don't stay in your seat and miss this opportunity. God's doing something tonight.